Good evening, Asia. Good morning, Europe. Uh, welcome to our Jean Monnet lecture on EU Asia connectivity. This is uh, the last lecture in this year, 2021, uh, which has been a very uh, uh, dramatic year in many, in many respects. Uh, obviously, the pandemic comes to mind, but also with regard to relations between the European Union and Asia, we have seen uh, quite a few changes. And um, my name is Sebastian Berzig, and it's my true pleasure to moderate this Jean Monnet lecture series that will deal with the topic EU-Asia shaping a new world order through connectivity. The lecture will be delivered by Dr. Anna Michalski. And um, she is uh, one of uh, the uh, scholars in, in Europe that have dealt with Asia relations and European foreign policy in her work um, for uh, many years now. She is a uh, professor in political science at the Department of Government at uh, Uppsala University, and uh, also a senior associate research fellow at the Swedish Institute of International Affairs. She is as well an affiliated associate professor at the School of Modern Languages and Culture at Hong Kong University, and a chair for the Swedish Network for European Studies in Political Science, as well as a member of the Swedish Foreign Policy society. Her work focuses uh, largely on European foreign policy, on EU-China relations, uh, the strategic partnerships and socialization processes in international organizations. Um, she has held visiting academic positions uh, in many places, uh, for instance, uh, at Hong Kong University, at uh, Fudan University in Shanghai, and the Europe Institute uh, in New Zealand at Auckland University, as well as several foreign policy research institutes and the European Commission. So there is, um, in addition to her uh, strong theoretical interest, uh, she also has a, a strong policy-oriented um, focus, uh, which um, suits perfectly with regard uh, to the uh, topics and issues that we discuss here. And um, she has published widely in international scientific journals and for international academic publishers, and is also co-editor of the Pelgrave book series, International European Studies. Um, in, on the 1st of December this, uh, this year, that is a couple of, what, two weeks ago, the, uh, the European uh, Commission came out with a, with a new strategy that is the, the Global Gateway Strategy, it is called, which is um, uh, a, a reaction uh, uh, to, uh, to mainly the People's Republics of China's Belt and Road Initiative. And um, uh, that is a document uh, which uh, brings the discourse and the debate about connectivity, EU-Asia connectivity to a global level. Uh, so it is um, certainly um, important to ask the question uh, in how far um, we do observe, we are witnesses to, um, well, the development, the evolution, so to speak, of um, what uh, can be called a new world order through connectivity. And this is what uh, uh, um, Dr. Michalski will talk about. And um, Anna, um, the floor is yours. We're looking forward uh, to, your, to your talk. I'm very pleased to be here. And I'm um, very pleased also to, to talk to you about this uh, subject. It's very topical. And I think uh, there's lots of things in the subject that uh, we also will uh, learn as, as uh, the, the, in the following years how, how this will actually 
play out and what will happen with the EU's interest and, and engagement in Asia. I will open my, my PowerPoint slide here for you. All right, so in the, this talk, uh, my aim is to discuss a little bit the new policy towards Asia and the Pacific that, that was launched in the Asia, in the Pacific strategy in September, and now lately was followed up in the Global Gateway Initiative. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the underlying from, from the EU uh, and whether or not they can actually strengthen the EU's um, strategic autonomy. And I'm also going to say a little bit about uh, what I think uh, these two initiatives can sort of assist or can push the EU to have some sort of say of the new international order that is now emerging in front of us. Uh, so I'm going to talk uh, firstly a little bit about the context and then I'm going to bring up what uh, a geopolitical commission will could actually entail because this is a new concept and it's a very interesting concept for us to study. Uh, and then I'm going to, to talk to you about the uh, Indo-Pacific uh, strategy and the, um, the Global Gateway Initiative. And then towards the end, I, I will come back to the questions whether EU is or could become uh, a strategic global actor, uh, and certainly in this, uh, in this region of the world, and uh, whether the EU can be expected to take part in the shaping of the new uh, international order. What is characterizing um, uh, this shift as we see uh, now in the beginning of uh, uh, this 21st century. Well, first of all, we have the emerging powers and that's epitomized by, by the rise of China and everything and the consequences that follow from that that we, we start to see now uh, the sort of the results of. Uh, and therefore we have a change in world order. Uh, the old liberal world order is, uh, is still there, but it's changing and it's many people think that it, it is uh, changing in the sense that it's weakening. Uh, one of the things that is happening is that we have, a, we have had a number of crises in the Western hemisphere, for instance, the financial economic crisis, the migration crisis, uh, instability in the European neighborhood. Um, we also have internal threats to democracy in Europe, and I would say also in the USA. Uh, we have a rising uh, right-wing uh, populist parties, uh, and that has given a lot of polarization within some European uh, countries and also the US. This is, of course, uh, seen as a weakening of, the, of democracy as a model uh, and give sort of give impetus to those states that, uh, um, well, have a different view of how uh, the country should be run. We also have a very marked uh, mounting uh, rivalry be between the US and China. And that is, of course, something that is very much, um, let's say, uh, putting its mark on international politics for the moment. And then we have this uh, sort of flaunting of the pr principles of and rules of the liberal world order. We can see that in the international uh, organizations like the, the, the World Trade Organization or the World Health Organization. And we also see it in the number of uh, different treaties that, and uh, agreements that have been broken. And we can also see it in the lack of cooperation um, or at least the sort of the, uh, let's, see the, let's say the sort of ambivalent cooperation uh, uh, when it comes to implementing um, the Paris Agreement on climate change. So there's a lot uh, happening for the mo moment and it's putting a lot of pressure not only on the US and Europe, um, but also in, uh, in Asia uh, more widely in other uh, Asian uh, states. Um, okay, so can you help me to switch the slide? So uh, a geopolitical European Commission, that is what uh, Ursula von der Leyen said in her inaugural speech in September 2019. And this is actually quite surprising because uh, the EU is, uh, and, and then also the role of the European Commission within the, the EU sort of uh, constellation of uh, institutions is anything but based on geopolitics. Geopolitics come from IR realism. Um, and then uh, it means a couple of things that has not been practiced by the European Union uh, up until now. 
So it, it, it's based on having a more strategic view on how international relations should be, um, should be uh, uh, managed. Uh, it means that uh, geography and geographical presence is important. You should look after your own interests elsewhere in the world. And it also puts much more um, emphasis on spatial and material dimension, which means that having access to certain raw materials or being present in a certain part of the world, all that is very important. And instead of sort of talking about multilateralism and global governance and so on, it's very much premised on statecraft, which again has to do with uh, being able to, to enforce or implement your interest. So what lies behind this shift, because this shift is, uh, I, I would say, is very uh, important for the EU. If that is really how the EU and the European Commission and, and the, uh, the External Action Service, for that matter, is going to sort of uh, devise and, and forge, uh, implement EU foreign policy in the, in the future. Well, of course, it has to do with what I said uh, before, the change in global context. And it has forced the EU to take a more strategic outlook on the world. We saw that already in the global strategy in 2016. And this is now being sort of played out in a, in a more concrete way. Uh, it has to do with the, a realization in Europe that the interest, interest of both China and also the US uh, in a different way have changed quite a lot and that that changed in in the way in which they intend to in implement their interests is not always to Europe's uh, advantage. Uh, we've seen during the pandemic and I think uh, the pandemic was like a let's say like a, 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 a moment in time when this became very obvious we have seen uh, uh, the, the sort of more fragility when it comes to global value change, uh, which on, of course, our sort of global economic model is built on. Uh, we've seen a problem to get access to different kinds of strategic goods, if it's microchips or other, and also strategic material. And then we also, in Europe, I think, are starting to realize the consequences of falling behind in the technological race whether that has to do with AI, telecommunications, uh, battery storing techniques and so on. So it's actually getting a bit dangerous not to be up to speed and have something to say about these things. Uh, and then we also have, of course, the EU's, uh, let's say, internal uh, objectives and goals, where, among others, the, the switch to a green economy is very important. So please help me to switch side, slide again. Yes, yeah, so in this context, the, the Indo-Pacific strategy, uh, the launch of that is very important, uh, or I think at least potentially very important. So the EU has previously said that it needs to strengthen its own strategic autonomy and it's going to become more geopolitical. Uh, and that then, therefore, I mean, if we follow the sort of logical uh, consequence of that, it needs to be present in the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, that is a region of economic growth, but it's also a region of a big sort of uh, and amounting uh, geostrategic uh, tensions. Um, there's another reason, and, and that is also because the EU is now sort of uh, very inconveniently placed in this US-China uh, rivalry. Uh, it, it's sort of caught in between. Uh, it would like sort of be able to cooperate with China and have a good and working relationship with US. And if, if this rivalry is sort of becoming even more intense, well, uh, the EU has to manage potential fallouts and fallouts that could actually be very detrimental to itself. Um, and therefore, I think the EU, the, this Indo-Pacific strategy uh, is a way for the EU to say that we want to be present in this region. We have understood the, the sort of re, uh, the geostrategic um, importance of this region, and we have to be there. Uh, and it says that in a way which is interesting. It, it's much more upfront with its interests. Uh, in some other documents, it also talks about its own sovereignty when it comes to uh, economic affairs, for instance. Um, it's much more also much more upfront also with what it would like to project. So we know that the EU, since a number 
of years sees itself as a normative power and had wanted or have wanted to pro project uh, human rights, democracy, and so on, and also a rules based international uh, system. And here we see how the EU comes back to, to those values and principles and, and really tries to uh, say that it, it wants to work on this in, the, in this uh, Indo Pacific region. Uh, and it's very strong here on saying that we need to build a partnership. We need to build on those we have and forge new ones. So the question is uh, whether or not the Indo-Pacific strategy is a concrete uh, example of the EU's, the EU strengthening its, its strategic autonomy. Uh, please help me to change slide. So a little bit just to situate what the Indo-Pacific strategy says um, and how we can understand it. And I think in a way it, it is an uneasy balance between what I call the usual EU that we know from uh, maybe 20 years back, how it tries to forge uh, relations with states and organizations around the world and a, a new more strategic EU. So in a way it's finding its way into this more new uh, political world. Uh, when it comes to the areas it mentions uh, where it wants to uh, cooperate, is the ones we know from before and the obvious ones is trade, climate and environment, uh, digital uh, cooperation and digital infrastructure. It mentioned connectivity and we'll come back to that in a second. Uh, but it also mentioned uh, uh, the management of the ocean, maritime routes and so on. And then uh, it mentions uh, or it sort of takes quite a lot of space in this uh, uh, in this strategy to talk about strategic partnerships and strategic partnerships if we think about what they are they are really uh, sort of bilateral um, uh, privileged relations that's the states or organizations in the in the case of the eu build with one each other where you together with a, a, a like-minded partner or one that you would like to influence to become a like-minded partner, work together on specific areas and build a, a relationship of trust um, and also sort of build into the partnership um, a, a diplomatic dialogue. And here the EU says that that is the way to go, to strengthen the strategic partnership it has um, and forge new ones. And then for the first time uh, in this kind of uh, strategy documents, we also see security being mentioned as such. And there is also mentioning that some EU member states could contemplate to be uh, military, have a military presence in, in, in the, uh, especially in the uh, South and uh, East China seas. So what can the ultimate aims be? It says in the, in the strategy that the EU wants in, it wants to be, it wants to have a strategy or a presence in the region, which is principled and long-term. And we can wonder what that is. Well, if we think about ge in geostrategic terms, it has very much to do with material aims. So access to strategic goods, uh, microchips, for instance, secure economic competitiveness, uh, by the by, uh, securing global value change, and also to sort of enforce and maybe spread EU regulatory frameworks. Uh, it also has some additional uh, values here. It wants to um, pro uh, project and promote, uh, and those are the ones we we know from before. But it also has to do with rules of and principles, and even uh, sort of more specific rules when it comes to how to regulate certain new areas like uh, the digital infrastructure, for instance. And then, of course, it has, as I said before, these strategic aims that we see for the first time. So I would like to summarize that to say that the EU has a new shaping uh, aim with being present in the Indo-Pacific uh, region. So if you can please help me to change slide. So uh, if we then go back and think about connectivity, which is mentioned in the Indo-Pacific uh, strategy document, uh, we can wonder what, what that is. And it says in the documents that the EU here intends to build on 
the 2018 EU Asia Con Connectivity Strategy. Uh, and this one, when this strategy, when it was launched, it came across as, um, as rather bland, uh, a quite unspecific strategy is sort of the EU feeling its way to this more geopolitical uh, dimensions. Uh, and it left a lot to read between the lines. But if we want to sort of put a, a let's say, strategic uh, twist to what the EU Asia Connectivity Strategy could be or was intended to be, it was clear that it wanted to enforce uh, principles of good governance. And we'll come to back to that in a, in, in a little while, what the EU could have meant. Uh, it was also quite uh, open with the fact that it wanted to achieve some strategic and material aims. So build with uh, build infrastructure projects with partners in Central Asia, for instance, has been very prominent, but also in uh, South East, Southeast Asia and with Japan and South Korea and so on. And it also wanted to project something I call programmatic aims, which have to do with the fact that the EU now is going through a very, or is starting a very uh, important transformational shift to the green economy. And if that is going to work uh, for the EU internally, then it also has to project some of these sort of uh, um, climate change and environmental uh, uh, objectives also uh, wide, more widely in the world. Um, so if we think about tools of statecraft, which in this strategy is actually not that prominent or not lifted up as such, we have uh, the economic ones, again, aid and trade, but uh, as I said before, they are not very specific. We have regulatory dissemination, which is mentioned, but is again, not sort of pinpointing anyone or anything in particular. And then there is a little bit, um, let's say, uh, a, a, a quite way, vague way of talking about enhancing attractiveness. And we can wonder in that strategy, is that in comparison to the Bed and Road Initiative? So please, next slide. So then we have global, the Global Gateway Initiative that was published uh, on the 1st of December. And this, I think, is really interesting because it builds on the connectivity strategy, but it, ha it has become uh, very much clearer much more strategic and much more assertive. So here it's like the EU come from its good old self uh, in the connectivity strategy, really walking into the geopolitical world of today and sort of reshaping the old connectivity strategy into what it calls the Global Gateway Initiative. So uh, of course it's sort of uh, pushed on or uh, let's say it's, it's pushed by the the new political geopolitical context, which became very, very obvious when it comes to material interest and economic interest during the pandemic. Uh, but what it also does here in a way that's different from before is that it, it, it wants to offer something concrete to partners in Asia and in the in the Indus uh, Pacific region uh, of European engagement. Uh, and very clearly says that we are offering an other governance model uh, than the one that's ruling uh, the, or under uh, uh, sort of in between the lines, uh, a different one from the BRI um, uh, sort of economic and economic assistance model. Here we want to do something which is quite different, build in partnership with countries and not uh, sort of giving rise to local uh, dependencies we are going to work in a very different way. And then again, it comes back to its own internal transformative policy paradigms, which are uh, then are very, I think are very important as we go further uh, and see how this gate, uh, Global Gateway Initiative pans out. Uh, when it comes to the aims, it's much, it's underlying val a value-based or so not a rule-based uh, international order, but it says we are, we're basing this on a value-based uh, view uh, on what the EU should do in the world. Again, it mentions good governance and so on. And then the, uh, very clear on security. And here is the way to implement it through economic and strategic means. So concrete in implementation wise, the EU is going to use uh, existing development funds, but it's also going to work with the private sector companies, uh, of course, which are present 
uh, in this region and uh, uh, European international multilateral financial institutions. So it's sort of building a, a financial alliance to uh, support these initiatives. It's put in 300 billion euros over seven years, which is uh, quite substantial and much more than uh, the old connectivity strategy would have sort of uh, ever had have um, sort of uh, been able to put on the table. And then it's going to use something called Team Europe, which I think can be quite uh, interesting and quite important when it also comes to force the EU's presence in the world. And Team Europe quite uh, simply means that on, on the localities, in the, uh, the, um, uh, the capitals and elsewhere, around the world where the EU is present with, with the delegation and the member states have embassies, they should now work together on, on uh, initiating, um, managing and finding these kind of interesting infrastructure projects that could then profit from the Global Gateway Initiative. Okay, please change um, slide. So uh, then to Go back to the questions uh, I raised in the beginning of the talk, whether the EU is becoming a strategic, glo a strategic global actor with uh, uh, these initiatives. We can say that yes, maybe at least more than before, for sure. So what's different is it different is that it's um, it's very clearly six presence in this region, and it very clearly says that it's ready to compete. Uh, on the material additional level that um, that is necessary for its own interest and it's also its milieu shaping goals in the world. Uh, it has become much more uh, sort of clear about what the strategic interests are, uh, and most of them, of course, are uh, let's say economic or uh, technological or based on people to people. Uh, interaction like education or research collaboration and so on. And then there is a much clearer security dimension that we haven't really seen in these terms before. The EU has been present, uh, of course, in the world, in Africa, and also sometimes in Southeast Asia with different kinds of uh, security uh, oriented missions. But this time security has become a a dimension of its own uh, strategy. So that's something new, I think. But on the same time, we can say, uh, no, not really, at least not yet, and maybe not. Maybe it's not convincingly doing this in, uh, for the moment. Uh, and one thing is that, um, well, it talks a lot about partnership with like-minded states, and here it has uh, very much uh, in in uh, in its mind, Japan and South um, South Korea, with which it has associate uh, association agreements and and also strategic partnerships already. It's also thinking a lot about uh, ASEAN. Uh, it thinks it can work through and with ASEAN to sort of put forward some of these goals and also shape the let's say the the strategic environment in, uh, in, in Southeast Asia. But it's quite ambivalent still when it comes to how to deal with China in itself. It still wants to cooperate with China on certain issues and in certain areas, but it also sees China as a, uh, as a systemic rival. And that's very clear when it comes to the sort of governance aspect of uh, the global ga uh, gateway on, on the EU side and the BRI on the Chinese side. Here, the EU and, uh, and China are actually sort of clashing when it comes to what kind of principles should rule uh, when, it, when it comes to uh, um, uh, economic and other uh, assistance uh, and what kind of uh, principles should be promoted in global governance. Uh, here, it's very unclear how that is going to pan out. And also, of course, a little bit with, uh, with the US, if, um, because the US, US is now taking a, a very tough stance towards China when it comes to Taiwan, for instance, and other issues. Will the EU follow or will it try to find a sort of way in between? It's still quite strong on carrots, as usually, but not so strong on sticks. And I think here we cannot expect the EU to become a military power. Uh, at, I think that is not at all on the cards, but it could, for instance, make use 
uh, of its coercive economic tools, so its tools of uh, economic statecraft, uh, which, is, which is already there, but which is not used in a strategic sense for the moment. And I'm thinking, for instance, about blacklisting and so on. Uh, the EU is primarily blacklisting very small countries, but not, for instance, other big uh, countries, for instance, China. So here the EU could be more for forthright and outcome. Uh, and then it's also very uh, unclear how the EU is going to deal with a, the, a possible sort of um, conflict in the, in the, um, in the Taiwan Strait. Uh, and also in its, uh, let's say, in its relationship to Xinjiang and uh, Hong Kong. Um, and then, of course, it's there to manage interdependence, but how? And in the case of uh, a sort of increasing uh, um, tense great power rivalry, where will the, uh, the EU actually sort of find its, its place there? Um, I think that is very interesting to study. And then, of course, we shouldn't remember that we shouldn't forget that when I talk about the EU, there are lots of differences in outlook between the EU member states. And uh, even though they were in agreement to, to publish or to launch the Indo Pacific strategy, I mean, the disagreements that we know, the dissension that we know from, from, uh, from EU foreign policy will resurface when it comes to specific projects and vis a vis specific countries. And then, of course, we also have some differences of view between different EU institutions, for instance, the European Council and European Parliament. So um, please, uh, next slide, uh, which is also my last slide here. And that is uh, the question whether or not we can expect EU to, to be shaping or to be one of the, let's say, powers that shape the emerging international order. And I think the answer is that, yes, it, it is trying in a way, but it's trying in its own way, even if it's become more geopolitical, more strategically minded, it's still the EU and not uh, a sovereign country or a sovereign state. So it, it cannot do it by itself. And that's why we see so much emphasis on building uh, uh, relations and strategic partnership with what it calls like-minded uh, Asian countries or Pacific powers like Australia. Uh, interesting also is to note the, the new US-EU dialogue on China and what that will bring. Uh, it is just started, so we'll see if that uh, sort of be, sort of paved the way for a more streamlined view on China, but that we, we just have to wait and see. And then we have this uh, more uh, this kind of old idea with the EU becoming a third pole in a multipolar system. But I actually think we are past that time, and I, I don't think it's a very relevant way of thinking about the EU's position in the new uh, emerging order. Um, so something else than a, being the third pillar in a multipolar system, I think. So just to sort of uh, round this up, I think we can say that uh, through these two initiatives, uh, and especially the Indo-Pacific strategy, we can see a little bit more of a strategic um, autonomy, uh, sort of a, a role of strategic autonomy for the EU with a hint of geopolitics, but it's still based on the sort of the way in which the EU uh, previously have, have promoted its, its interests and values in the, in the world. So uh, um, this is to be studied very in intensively in the, in the future, and I'm sure will be very interesting to see how this pans out. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Anna, for your, for your, for your uh, presentation and for um, bringing us um, up to speed when it comes to um, not only the latest uh, developments um, within the EU's um, involvement and in increasing engagement uh, in the region, uh, and um, uh, but also the the uh, the, the analytical questions uh, that that come with this, with it, especially uh, in regard to 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 questions of of, of governance, right, and the um, the implications for uh, the well um, the, the the evolution or the further development of the international system in terms of um, will we see. Um, a, a, a trajectory that 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 confirms 
um, what we what we have seen since um, well the end of World War II that is a, a liberal international order or is this system transforming into something new that is um, um, and 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 if so what what then is is the contribution um, of the and can be the contribution of the EU here um, uh, I will um, uh, I want to encourage all of you um, uh, that is uh, the audience to raise to raise your questions uh, and um, to to pose them in the um, questions and and answers um, chat box. So please uh, do so. Um, Anna, I was I was wondering, um, reading the through the documents. Um, that is the, the, the I mean you, you mentioned them the global um, the global strategy 2016 then we have 2018 we have the, the the EU connectivity strategy the EU Asia connectivity strategy um, then we have the Indo-Pacific uh, strategy this year now at the end of this year we have the global gateway um, is there a risk of strategic overreach? Um, but uh, that uh, I mean, the EU suddenly becoming so uh, well, at least in in well, so 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 involved, engaged. Mm -hmm. um, uh, is the let's see what about the material uh, side side of things um, in financial terms? You mentioned the, the, those those three hundred billions, yes. And what about the other capabilities uh, uh, that uh, that are needed? Um, what is your what, what what is your 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 thinking here? Mm. Mm, yes, uh, you can see it in two ways. I think you can see it as uh, the EU wants to be present everywhere, and we see one strategy, one communication after the other popping up, and and you wonder is there really some sort of st strategic overview over this, or is it just sort of piecemeal reactions when something is happening? Uh, for instance, when I mean the, when the EU sees China's influence in the EU member states, or you know, in the countries, uh, the states which are otherwise important to the EU, for instance, in Africa, uh, that the EU sees a necessity to sort of react to that, but there's not much behind. Sort of, there's no really thought out strategy uh, which can actually deliver something, which can which can start to shape change this perception, for instance, in, in China or, or cent Central Asia, that um, you know, when it comes to having an international partner, well, China actually is delivering, but the EU is not. Um, so uh, that would be a strategic overreach in that sense, uh, that you, you talk up your, uh, you know, your objectives and your goals, but you don't deliver. Um, so there's always that, uh, let's say, that, uh, that danger. But I think there are some things in here which are important. And for instance, just thinking about how the, you know, the coordination of uh, EU foreign and security policy on the ground uh, works. Um, so uh, in all these places, I think it's about 140 places. Um, so capitals and other uh, uh, sort of um, localities in the world and a number of international organizations. Where the EU is present with a delegation and mem member states are, are present with their embassies, uh, they actually work together very well if there is a, a strategy, if there is an agreed strategy. They have promised to work together when there isn't like an agreed line to take or an agreed sort of pol policy framework to, to fall in line with. But once there is that, they can actually work together quite well. Uh, and the more they are out on the ground, let's say in Africa or in Asia, the better it works. So they have a much better coordination. Uh, also, when it comes to identifying projects uh, and, uh, and manage those projects uh, on the ground uh, than it has in, let's say, in the, in the big capitals. So here, I think that the fact that there is so much stress on Team Europe, uh, which is not which is not very well explained in the strategy documents, but you have to understand uh, from what is actually happening on the ground uh, where the EU works, well, the Commission and the EES works together with, uh, with EU member state embassies. 
it could actually have quite a lot of impact. And it could also give the EU uh, more visibility as a unified actor. Um, when it comes to the EU's development assistance, I mean, the member states are also, uh, in Africa, for instance, the member states are also present there with our national development assistance, but they are, they are streamlining that kind of assistance into to common goals and within common sort of policy frameworks. And with um, the global gateway strategy, which is so clearly sort of uh, oriented towards uh, infrastructure, digital and physical and also people to people infrastructure. Well, then that would give some steer to what is actually happening on the ground. And that would at least to uh, sort of in, in a way sort of, uh, let's say, um, give the EU more presence and not uh, a sort of a, a overreach in, in trying to solve problems by, by pronouncements and, and, and launching documents. Well, um, thank you for for for, for your for your uh, answer here. And um, actually, in the meantime, we have uh, we have a couple of additional additional questions, uh, uh, which um, which also relate back to to what you've just said. And um, they are uh, very much concerned about um, uh, actors and issues, uh, not so much about institutions so far, but. Um, um, the, with regard to actors, um, the, the the question of of, of China, uh, China's Belt and Road um, Initiative, and in how far the global gateway uh, strategy and uh, and the Belt and Road, uh, whether they are um, uh, in how far they 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 uh, can be. Well, they are mutually exclusive, uh, so to speak. So whether this is a conflicting um, whether this is a conf these are conflicting developments, um, or whether the, the, the two blocks are uh, able to work uh, collaboratively, um, and this is uh, this is one one aspect, and um, uh, another one is um, and that is uh, that is uh, raised by um, Ambassador uh, uh, Michael Reiter. Um, uh, good morning, Michael. Uh, to Austria, I, I suppose. Um, he, he is um, uh, asking or referring to security and, um, in, in, and um, underlining that um, security is becoming more uh, increasingly uh, not only uh, important, but also an issue that is a, a topic area uh, in EU-Asia uh, uh, relations. However, um, wouldn't it be necessary to to uh, to enhance security cooperation, uh, especially with those like-minded um, uh, partners, namely uh, Japan, uh, the Republic of Korea, India? So the the, um, the 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 current connectivity partners are soon to become uh, possibly um, that also includes ASEAN. Um, so, so how does does security blend in here? Mm -hmm. And um, to add an additional uh, uh, aspect that is that is also raised, um, um, uh, that is the, uh, the the United States of America. Um, how can um, how can the the EU um, achieve uh, strategic autonomy? Um, uh, when um, at the same time it has to um, uh, team up uh, with with the United States uh, uh, in even um, possibly in even stronger uh, terms, um, uh, that is a further uh, that is a further question or issue area that has been posed. So um, uh, please uh, relate uh, to those various aspects, right? Actors. Uh, issues here uh, and 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 also um, yeah, institutions. Mm -hmm. mm, okay, thank you. Um, I mean, I'm I'm not a fly on the wall in the sort of in the rooms where these things are discussed in the in the EU. So I'm just drawing my own conclusions um, from having studied the, the documents and so on. Sure. But uh, when it comes to uh, the China, China China's BRI and and the Global Gateway Initiative. 
uh, I think it's very clear that there is a clash. Uh, there is a clash of governance. Uh, and if we think about the fact that, um, well, it hasn't happened yet, but there is an intention of actually there is no way around the fact that we are going to clash on the way which we um, we engage uh, uh, other com other countries and other states, uh, especially in this kind of infrastructure um, investment projects. And I think we should uh, then maybe remember when the Commission said that China, uh, or the EU has said that, uh, that China is a systemic uh, rival. Uh, when it comes to global governance, uh, and when it comes to the sort of values, if you like, but if we have a, a wide interpretation of values, uh, well, China and the EU now can't pretend that we somehow can, you know, that we can we can have, uh, let's say, an, an, a, 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 a constructive ambiguity about that. We we are on very different uh, sort of in very different worlds here. And there will be a, a kind of a systemic clash. But of course, uh, this is more a clash on the level of attractiveness and the level of, maybe we can call it soft power, although it seems a little bit outdated um, in this sort of geopolitical world we're living in. But I, but I think, you know, here we can see how um, the EU is actually now thinking that we need to to be quite firm here, and we need to, uh, you know, take take the consequences or or sort of face the consequences of being a systemic rival when it comes to China in terms of governance. And we can see it also not only in the Global Gateway Initiative, but we will see it also in other uh, sort of initiatives or uh, even legislation that the EU has now adopted. Uh, for instance, the, the carbon border tax, when that, that one is uh, implemented, um, that would be, a, that would be an, a lot of uh, complaints and a lot of uh, sort of conflict on uh, why the EU can sort of <clears throat> uh, have an extraterritorial approach to its own climate change uh, objectives. It's going to be extremely interesting to see, and we're really already seeing China voicing a lot of concerns and things that, uh, and we might also make use of the WTO here. Uh, when also we see it in the, the screening of FDIs, so foreign direct investments, uh, for, for their impact on public order and security. I mean, we would not have seen that, uh, let's say, 10 years ago. Uh, so I think uh, that that is uh, it's very clear. There's no way around that. and. Uh, Global Gateway is very, it doesn't mention China, but uh, uh, it's very clear in that context, but it's very clear that it's the China's BRI it's, uh, it's hinting at or it's alluding to. Uh, okay, so, and security, how is it blending, blended in? I think actually Ambassador Reiter knows much better than I. <laughs> but uh, yes, of course, uh, there's no way around uh, the problem of security now in the, the tai Taiwan Strait or in the South China Sea or even the East China Sea. Uh, uh, security is, you know, the security, let's say, concerns are very real and very tangible. Uh, as we know, the, I mean, it's clear that the Indo-Pacific strategy was uh, promoted inside the EU primarily by Germany, France, and Netherlands, who see that they have sort of what they call, at least France and Netherlands, call so sovereignty concerns in, in this region. Uh, but also Germany is interested in, or is concerned about the, the sort of lack of security or the mountain security tensions uh, in this part of the world. And it is already present or has been present also militarily. So of course, uh, uh, what I can see or understand is that the EU here is going to work with sort of, let's say its best partners. So it seems to be Japan and ASEAN, uh, and maybe also a, a few other countries to sort of strengthen their um, strategic and military uh, frameworks and uh, architecture. And how that will, it will be done in, um, uh, in relation to the US, well, that is, of course, the, the, the real question. Is, 
the, the EU here, I suppose, cannot entirely align with the US. The EU is not a security, I mean, it's not in a security alliance with, with the US. It's, uh, the member states are in NATO, um, but uh, here the EU will, come, will have to come to some sort of, um, let's say, agreement with itself how it's going to handle the security uh, dimension. Um, so, um, it, it's not what I understand is that it's not entirely clear yet. What is clear, though, it's going to do a lot and trying to bolster its own um, ability to, uh, let's say, to meet a cyber, uh, more cyber oriented security threats. And that, of course, it will do uh, by protecting uh, its own cyberspace. And then the, the US, yes, there is a dilemma here. If the e EU aligns too much with the US, if we think in, in those terms, uh, then the EU will, of course, have lost part of its strategic autonomy. That's very clear. So it, it's very much a, a matter of how it teams up with the US and whether or not there is actually, a, let's say, a position for the EU, U, the EU to be, I mean, to be leaning US as it still is, but also being um, you know, concerned about having a, a good relation, or at least a, a functioning relationship with China and cooperation in certain areas. So, in a way, uh, uh, maybe kind of a strategic balancing in that case. Um, it's very concerning for everyone who's interested in Asia and in, in China, China and so on, to see how much China is isolating itself uh, for the moment. And uh, that isolation, um, I mean, now it's under the I mean, under the, I say, umbrella of, of, of the pandemic, but after the pandemic or when the pandemic had receded, we need to find ways to engage with China again. It's very important. Yes, let's let's um, follow up on this aspect. Um, that is um, the need to engage um, and to cooperate. You mentioned the the, the carbon border tax. There is one question. Uh, in relation to climate governance and uh, the question in how far the uh, the EU and and uh, Asia connectivity uh, can actually contribute uh, to uh, to to climate to questions of climate governance um, so um, China that is 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 now casting itself as a, as a new climate leader um, uh, since we, we, we seem to all agree that, that climate uh, is one area where cooperation is needed and not competition and, and rivalry, um, what is, what, what, what is your, your take here? Uh, yes, of course, that's the area where we need to seek uh, cooperation with China. Uh, and I think the, the idea of cooperation or, or sort of some kind of global governance when it comes to stemming climate change uh, is not at all unconceivable. I think, or it's very much, I suppose, sought after by the parties themselves. I think the, the, the difficult thing is when it comes to the more specific uh, sort of measures which are, are to be taken. Uh, and there the EU, I mean, of course, has come the furthest. Uh, I mean, the, the EU climate change technology and solutions and also the whole society sort of uh, approach that the EU has to climate change um, is, is not emulated by anyone else for the moment, uh, at least not to any of the, the sort of the big uh, countries here we're talking about. So whether the EU could sort of socialize China in, into that way of thinking would of course be, um, I think would be very welcome, but I think quite resisted by China. Uh, I think when it comes to the specifics, um, where we see, for instance, how China is not reducing its dependency on coal and so on, which would be the, the first most, most obvious step, then the, uh, I think that there could be actually quite a lot of difficult uh, discussions. And we saw that in Paris as well when it came to the binding targets that, that the EU was uh, proposing. Uh, uh, which was resisted by China and by the US for that matter. Uh, but here, um, let's say the, the EU is, has a different agenda, which is not, uh, you know, in this, on this, in the specifics, 
which is not aligned with the Chinese agenda. And I think there could be quite a lot of disagreement about the, the more specific measures that are uh, that would be necessary to take to stem climate change. There are there are other uh, questions that are less uh, focusing on cooperative the cooperative dimension, but more on the um, conflictual uh, one, and that um, refers to um, geopolitical aspects. Uh, one is um, the relationship of, of of China and Russia, and the possible um, well and, and and a strengthening if, uh, of their uh, of their of their relationship. Um, uh, and what that uh, risk uh, could entail for um, for the relations uh, and the role actually of the of the EU in in, in Asia, mm -hmm. especially when we think in terms of a scenario that 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 brings in um, um, uh, military further military developments in, in 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 Ukraine. So this is one 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 aspect here. The other one is. Uh, about the, the the quad and its impact mm -hmm. on on the EU, um, um, and one one that is to say, will that push? Uh, will that have a have a effect on on the EU that will uh, even accelerate the EU's geopolitical uh, development of a stronger geopolitical identity? In by by mm -hmm. by, by that then then also role. Um, this is obviously also linked to to. To AUKUS, right? So all these uh, all these strategic uh, developments. Um, so um, we are again talking about here then uh, of of those different functions that the EU is 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 gaining. One is as a as an actor that promotes cooperation, but additionally at the same time an actor. That that starts to to engage in and also manage increasingly competitive uh, uh, in a competitive uh, international um, uh, uh, climate. Mm. What about those 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 uh, security mm. aspects mm. that bring in actors like Russia and um, and also the Quad? Mm. Um, yes, uh, I mean. Of course, it's, it's troubling, uh, but I suppose unavoidable in a way that China and Russia is trying is strengthening or strengthening their relationship. And they already have uh, a military cooperation. They have quite a strong sort of uh, let's say cooperative arrangement between themselves since uh, since quite a number of years. And of course, when they sort of see the West now with uh, with Joe Biden as a U.S. president. Uh, sort of being being seeing much more eye to eye when it comes to China and Russia, pushing back Russia, for instance, in in, in the Ukraine and so on. Of course, uh, I mean it's a, it's it's a reaction to to that, and it's a you know it's a troubling development. I think quite uh, quite frankly, um, yes, I think it will. Uh, anyhow, it it already has uh, an impact on the EU's role in in Asia. If it will sort of impact even more on the EU, for instance, in Central Asia, uh, it's a little bit too early to say. Um, I think when it comes to, uh, let's say, the, the waters around Japan, South Korea, and up, up there, uh, you know, all that can, if that becomes even more, ten, more there is more tension because also a, a sort of a increasingly a difficult relationship to Russia, then we have a huge problem in the whole uh, sort of uh, area there of, uh, from North Asia down to South, Southeast Asia. So it's not a good uh, development at all. And that's why I was saying before that uh, it's very important that uh, we don't isolate, for instance, China. China is isolating itself very much, but uh, we, we must have uh, ways in which we can have a uh, uh, let's say constructive dialogue at least with China and with Russia we'll have to to see what happens now uh, with with Ukraine but it's very clear that where the US previously withdraw for instance in the Middle East Russia stepped in and uh, it has sort of bolstered its own uh, position in the world at least in its own views 
So then we come to the, the other side of that, and that is the kind of, uh, you know, the alliances that the Western world are creating with Quad or Opus and so on. And the EU, um, well, uh, the EU has, as far as I know, no relationship to, no sort of link to AUKUS, but it wants to cooperate with the Quad. Um, and uh, I suppose that, yeah, it will, uh, it will strengthen this idea of the EU being a geopolitical uh, actor, at least developing geopolitical, uh, let's say, abilities. Uh, and it can do that, for instance, uh, when it comes to, to cyber warfare or other kinds of um, mm. sort of, um, you know, new, what we used to kind call new kinds of warfare. There, the, I think, uh, you know, cooperation is, is welcome. We shouldn't uh, forget NATO here, which has also you know, now for the first time this autumn designated China as the, the biggest threat. Um, so, um, We'll see how, you know, on the security side, uh, where actually the EU will have a role and where maybe the EU member states through NATO will rather have a role. That is the perennial question, but it will uh, come up here again. Yes. Well, um, we are already um, running against time, if not to say past the hour. Um, however, um, there are there are a couple of more questions. Um, um, one is, um, and we will come to a close. Uh, have to come to a close as well, unfortunately. The one is uh, um, dealing with the, with the more concrete aspects of of um, um, of how the EU can respond to uh, to to coercive uh, uh, actions by other. By other countries, um, well, we, we we are all aware of the anti-coercion, the new uh, anti-coercion instrument that is being prepared uh, with regard to to, to uh, economic um, actions. Um, you, um, Anna, in your talk, you you mentioned this aspect of blacklists, right? The mm -hmm. tool of blacklist, and there is a question. Um, in how far this as a security tool can be can be implemented, how exactly could that be be used against, um, or, well, let's say in, in in with regard to possible actions by China or another large and powerful mm. partner. Um, mm. So uh, this is one, and then uh, there is a, a final question which uh, brings us back to to my original. Um, um, uh, a question uh, which is the overreach um, so um, apparently the global gateway project is still uh, very very vague in the sense that uh, there are no roadmaps and, and timetables uh, so um, what is your uh, what is your um, take uh, with regard uh, to 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 this uh, to the to to a to, to this criticism uh, stating that um, in fact it's it's still missing uh, teeth hmm. okay um, well uh, the blacklisting has to do with uh, the attractiveness of the EU market and and sort of the extra territorial effects or impacts of EU regulation in in certain areas um, and actually quite um, you know, the, the areas where the EU is active when it comes to blacklisting is taxation, uh, forestry, uh, fishing. <laughs> um, let's see, there's one where the EU is quite, um, well, anyhow, it's in, in specific areas. And for the moment, uh, it has gone after smaller, uh, weaker partners, which is you know, which is not, I think it's not the way in which if this has to do with a milieu shaping goal of actually changing some of the regulatory frameworks, uh, the global regulatory frameworks into frameworks that uh, uh, resemble very much the EU. So for instance, the G, uh, uh, in digital private privacy and, and security, for instance, GDPR, there the EU also has, uh, you know, uh, the possibilities of blacklisting countries. But uh, it works when countries want to have access to the EU market. So the problem with China is that the China is isolating itself in, in many ways. For instance, in the, you know when it comes to uh, you know to the digital world and 
basically creating a digital world of its of its own. So there maybe I mean it depends if China uh, is in is it has the need for access of EU raw materials or the EU market. Maybe there the you know the EU could work with with China and coerce it in, into you know to adopting some of its uh, uh, of its regulation. Um, but I, I think yes, I think the EU should look into that kind of possibility. Uh, uh, and then the, let's say um, the roadmaps and yes, the, it's always a problem with the, with announcing a big initiative like the global gateway. But uh, uh, and I haven't seen any roadmaps, of course. But now at least there is funding and there are projects going on in the you know in the old 2018 connectivity strategy. And I suppose that um, uh, also the EU, because in the Indo-Pacific strategy, it's also, uh, Africa is also um, included there, as well as some, uh, you know, some uh, South Asian countries that already receive EU development aid. And I think where those partnerships and those kind of frameworks are already in place, there is a better possibility actually to, to use the, the global gateway uh, as a tool, I would say. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Well, uh, um, and, and as I understand, currently um, uh, people are frantically working on identifying concrete mm -hmm. projects, right, mm -hmm. where the private uh, uh, sector uh, can, can come in as well. Uh, well, Anna, um, many thanks uh, for your for your wonderful uh, presentation and the and, and, and the Q and, and, and answering of the questions, uh, interacting with our um, uh, with everybody uh, who who is joining us here uh, for this um, for this Jean Monnet lecture on EU Asia connectivity. Um, uh, we uh, do look forward to welcoming you in the, in the next year, the forthcoming. Um, uh, Jean Monnet lectures. Uh, however, in, in the meantime, um, I wish uh, all of you uh, happy holidays, right, and uh, a Merry Christmas uh, for those who, 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 who apply this, 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 this term in their social context, so to speak. Um, and I also want to um, use this opportunity to thank you, uh, that is to thank the, the Jean Monnet team uh, that is uh, working hard to, to, to make these uh, Jean Monnet lectures uh, possible, um, uh, especially uh, uh, Mireya Paolo, uh, the, the, the research associate here at the Department of uh, the International Political Economy of East Asia at, at the Faculty um, of East Asian Studies at Ruhr University uh, Bochum, uh, but also our, our interns, um, who are uh, uh, making this 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 possible, uh, Miss uh, Dickmann and, and Miss Götze. Uh, so, uh, all of you, um, be safe, um, stay productive, and uh, see you again uh, next year. Bye bye. From thank you very much. Bochum. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you.